In the last course, we talked about um, the, the need for compression and just to be able to deal with uh, massive bandwidth uh, usage due to images and videos. <coughs> so today what we look at is uh, the human visual system and uh, not in much detail but just enough so you can see what are the tricks we could try to use uh, to help compression in a way that uh, we don't perceive the defect and you know trying to work where it's required and trying to exploit the flows of the human eye. So, and I'll start with core spaces, okay? And so something you might be aware of, but not the history of it and the detail of it. So let's start with the eye in a very uh, hand wavy way, uh, very uh, simple, oversimplify everything. So you have the eye, you have the a lens, and uh, the, the light gets um, focused on um, the, um, <coughs> the retina and on the retina you have uh, basically two types of, uh, uh, of, uh, of sensors, uh, types of cells that capture light. Uh, so we have the cones and the rods. So the cones are the one responsible for the color. Okay, so that's the one that gets you to be able to see what you see in color. And they're mainly near the center of the fovea, so the fovea is, um, you can maybe see on that, can you see something here? Where is the mouse? Ah, I don't have the mouse. Um, it's on the, near, near the optical nerve, right? It's the number seven here. No, near, um, between seven and eight. Um, and then you have the rods, and the rods are basically on the periphery of your eye, and they're mainly here to capture um, intensity, okay? So that's the one that you use for night vision and so on, okay? So it's more, you know, you have very poor resolution, but they allow you to see things in, in, in dark, dark light and to be able to see uh, essential things such as motion and so you can escape from predators. Right, so all that information, all these cells uh, send, uh, <coughs> so uh, uh, electric signals, uh, to the uh, uh, visual cortex. Uh, so the visual cortex is at the back of your, um, the brain here, and uh, it's, it's an amazing piece of um, technology that allows you to do a lot of things, so it allows you to interpret pictures straight away. So your brain doesn't have to work that much, okay? For instance, you have two eyes, and the two eyes, they see different views, okay? And but somehow, the visual cortex fuses all that information, so find a pixel, find the matching pixel in the other frame, uh, the other picture, sorry, and uh, you know, we, we know that they're both the same, and we fuse that so you can only see one, uh, one pixel and assess at the same time the distance of that pixel to you. Okay, so that's quite a lot of things that is done in the visual uh, cortex, and um, that we don't know how to do this that well in, um, in with actual um, image processing uh, techniques. Um, but we know how to do that by default in the visual cortex. So there's quite a lot of stuff going on. There are filters and also sort of quite high level um, maths involved in the visual cortex and that all that before even gets to your brain. Right, so on the left here, you have a representation of what the three types of cones you have. So I won't talk about the rods, I will talk only about the cones uh, in, in this course. And um, basically, um, <coughs> what you have is you have three types of cone, one that is more sensitive to the short wavelengths, so the blue, and one which is more sensitive to the medium wavelengths, so the green, and one to the uh, long uh, wavelengths, which is the more associated to the red. So you see there's a ma massive overlap between the, um, the medium and the, the long one, um, and so you know, that's something to keep in mind. Um, on the right here, you have the distribution of the cells, and, um, and you see mainly you have red dots, a few green, and a few blues, and, you know, and, and almost no blues in the center. So what you see here, I don't know if you can see, but in the center of the picture on the right, uh, you uh, don't see almost any blue dots, and that is because you actually almost don't see blue in the center of your fovea. 
Right. So, <coughs> um, light is, um, so it's a spectrum of uh, wavelengths, and uh, as, as you know that, and the, it's important to realize that when you look at color, okay? So why do you see a color, a particular you know, color? Um, and because we only have three sensors, we kind of limit it in what we can represent, okay? So to be able to represent the entire spectrum, we need to have an infinite amount of different kinds of sensors with different frequencies of the wavelengths, okay? <coughs> but here we only have three sensors that covers, uh, that have different uh, responses um, to the wavelengths. So here's a problem you might have, okay? So you have, say, two light sources um, that emit, uh, you know, the same, same place. So one is uh, blue and one is green. And what you see, the outcome of that is a color which is cyan, okay? Um, but you will see that no different from if you just had one light source which was actually of the cyan <coughs> uh, wavelengths, okay? And so that's the idea. So you have multiple combinations, like in real life, you don't have just, where well, you really have just one pure wavelength. What you have is different wavelengths combined together, and what you sense is just one color, okay? So you only see one hue of that color. And so that's why it's kind of, um, uh, you have to be careful, you know, when you see cyan, that doesn't mean that the originating uh, source was actually a cyan color, okay? Could have been just a combination of colors that led to, for you to believe that it is cyan. And this phenomenon is called uh, uh, metamerism, okay? And it's something that, uh, is quite important, and as a side note, uh, there is no such a thing really as a color, uh, well, at the, at the wavelengths for purple, okay? So uh, when you see, say, in the rainbow, you see purple, well, yes, but that's not a real wavelength, okay? What you see is a mixture of blue and red, okay? So you don't have, you know, the, 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 <clears throat> the shortest wavelengths are blue, and the very, like what you call indigo is actually just blue, um, but when you see purple, it's actually uh, a mix of blue and red, and your brain associates that with this purple color. Okay, so in a way, purple is quite a special color because you cannot find it um, um, in the real world as a just pure wavelength. All right, so in the 1920s, um, people were interested in reproducing color. Okay, so how do you go about uh, defining what really a color is, and you know, if you have, say, you know, beginning of um, digital imaging and so on, and people were like, okay, how do we define what a color is? And it'd be very useful not only for digital image, but for you know, reproducing prints, for instance. You know, if you if you're a printing press, you want to say, okay, this is this is blue, but what kind of blue are we talking about? So, what they done is studies on a uh, number of studies on trying to find can we reproduce? So we know there are three, we have three types of cones. Uh, you know, the spectrum of the response of these cones is quite broad, so we cannot really have a, a light that will um, replicate that kind of broad spectrum. So what we need to do is to say, uh, what's easier for us to do is to have uh, three lights, so red, green, and blue, okay? And we just use have very short, um, um, uh, uh, spectrum, and so you only have a pulse, you know, just at one, as, you know, think of three LEDs with pure, or three lasers with pure uh, red, green, uh, and blue uh, lights, um, pretty fine, so you know the wavelengths for these three ones. And the idea is to say, given a color that is given to you, can you find the combination of the red, green, and uh, blue uh, um, components that, that is required? And uh, so they did these studies, and I'll try to So, sorry, I'll put that in. Oh, this is going fast. It's not good. Um, there. Uh, so they did these kind of experiments, okay? So they would have, um, um, on, on the right, okay, they would have an experiment where you see a color which is just emitted by one uh, wavelength. So here, for instance, it's orange and it's, uh, 610 nanometers, okay? And on the left, you have the three lights, and the, the participants could, could um, uh, 
tweaked you know, uh, the, some knobs and try to say I want more of the red, more of the green or less of and so on. Okay? And they're trying to match what the human perception is. So at, at some point, okay, the participant says, the combination of my colors here for the red and green gives me orange, and that for me is um, the same as this orange. And so we try to find this combination to say, okay, this orange is actually a bit of the red and a bit of the green. And so they had that, and that uh, led to this kind of uh, uh, responses, okay? So they call the color matching functions, and that's because the idea is that you're trying to match what the human, the average human eye does, or human person does, okay? So you see on the x-axis you have the uh, wavelengths, um, going from the shortest, the shortest would be the bluest if you want, to the uh, uh, longest, so uh, going into the, the deep red. And on the y-axis you have um, the, uh, if you want the amount of that light you have to put in um, for a particular uh, stimulus. And you have the response of the, stri the, the uh, three stimulus, so the red, green, and blue. And the way you have to read that is to say uh, if you have um, a wavelength of uh, 600, so that will give you um, orange, uh, you read that you need a bit of green and you need a bit of red. Okay, So that much of red and that much of green, and then you can replicate this orange. And so they were able to, to plot these graphs, and that was very useful. Um, but then you see something quite alarming. Uh, these values here, and a bit of the blue, are negative. Right? And so uh, if you want to do this kind of color, so they're very, very green greens, if you want, um, then uh, you actually need to have negative red lights. Okay? And uh, so negative red lights, that doesn't mean anything. Okay? Uh, the, the way they come up about that was to say <coughs> that they had um, um, no something like that, right? So they had this very flashy green light that actually I cannot represent here because actually you cannot see this, uh, you cannot represent them in a, in the computer. Uh, but basically, you have this light that is very fluorescent or something like that. And uh, your eye will see this and try to match against these three stimulus. And you see, okay, no matter what you do with these three guys, you cannot actually reproduce the same kind of green, right? So what you need to do then is to so say this is your best match. What they've done is to add, to contaminate if you want, uh, the, the real color they would see with another primary source. They would say, um, this is the uh, hue I want to replicate, but they added some of the, uh, one of the primaries, so in this case, red. And they found like, if you add a bit of red on the target color, then I'm able to reproduce that color, okay? And that amount of red they have to add on this side is basically the negative uh, amount of red they have to put. Does it make sense, kind of? Um, so there should be actually you know, some kind of animation. Yeah, so you can see as you go along, here is the wavelengths, and here you see the hue of that um, um, that you're looking at. And you see on the left the amount of each of the three stimuli you need to input. And um, at the beginning, you need to subtract some red, and <coughs> at the end, you need to subtract some blue, okay? About a tiny bit of blue. <coughs> so, so right there, you start to understand that color is quite more complicated than you would think, okay? It's not just like you have RGB and everything is fine. Um, as it turns out, with just RGB, you cannot reproduce all the colors. You actually, you can see up there. Yes, question? Is it green, not yellow? Is yellow the primary color? Um, depends what you call primary colors, okay? Uh, so in this case, the primary colors are just red, green, and blue, okay? And that's because they kind of corresponds to the, that's your basis, okay? You have a, a basis of three, three points, three particular uh, wavelengths, and it's a bit arbitrary, but they're kind of loosely connected to what the human eye does. So one is like more, one of the cones is more blue, one of the cones is more about the green, and the other one is more about the <coughs> blue. So how do you suggest yellow? 
so yellow would be a combination of it's additive, okay? So yellow would be a, com uh, uh, a combination of uh, red and green. So yellow, okay, in theory, yellow is a, a wavelength which is in between red and green. Okay, so when you go on the spectrum, you have red, orange, yellow, green, right? So yellow would be just one of the wavelengths you have uh, for that. But you don't have a, a yellow light, okay? You only have access to three lights, which are red, green, and blue. So how do you go about that? Well, it turns out that if you have, so if you come back, um, but you come back here, okay? Um, if you give, uh, so yellow would be somewhere, I don't know, maybe here. I don't know exactly what the wavelength of yellow. Sorry, uh, more here, right? So uh, it turns out if you, me, me, your yellow is here and says, well, if you give me uh, a bit of green, a lot of red, for me, this is undistinguishable to yellow. All right, so that's the idea of uh, metamerism, that you, the, the real, light that comes to you is a mix of different colors, but you're going to ignore that. It's a spectrum. You're going to simplify the spectrum into this basis of three functions, or three points in the, in, in the, in the, in the spectrum. So lights come to you as a, as a spectrum, and the spectrum can do anything. And you're only going to say, I have this basis function of uh, three, three elements here, so, and I say that's red, green, and blue, and I just say, any spectrum that comes to me can be represented as a linear combination of these guys somehow, and that will solve my problem. But it's solved only, it's uh, physically incorrect, okay? It just solved the problem as a human eye won't perceive the difference, all right? Um, so anyway, so that was in the 20s, um, and um, so this story of the negative colors was quite, uh, Problematic. This is the proper way of, of seeing what's going on, okay? Uh, there's an integral, so it's a bit scary, but it'd be okay. Uh, just to say that the, the red is a combination of the actual input of your spectrum, so S of lambda, it's your spectrum, you know, the amount of spectrum you have, and the R is your matching function. And you say you're going to integrate the sum of all these guys, you know, the contribution of every single wavelength to the red uh, response, if you want, and that gives you how much red you need to put and so on. That's how you go from the full spectrum, how you use the, this matching function and the, <coughs> the actual spectrum you have to get back what the R, G, and B should be. Um, and the definition for the R, G, and B is this uh, uh, wavelength. So 700 nanometers for red, 546 for green, and 435 uh, for blue. And I don't know why they picked up this. This one, um, I, I, all right. So there's a nice link here. I, I, I'll put that on the slides. Um, some time passed, and at the time they didn't have computers, so they didn't like the idea of negative numbers, and they just found some kind of uh, wacky way. They did a, basically a, a linear combination of transformation of your RGB. So they, they applied a, a three by three matrix and transformed its RGB into a color space, color space called X, Y, Z. Now, X, Y, and Z don't correspond to any real wavelengths, okay? They correspond to a linear combination of wavelengths. So it's just a linear algebra, and they use that because the maths after were simpler, they just they didn't have negative numbers. And uh, the result is that the, the, the response here is everything is positive for the matching functions. Now, this is a bit complicated. Um, it's kind of non-intuitive. There's only one thing that is kind of intuited. The, the Y component actually corresponds to the intensity. So it's kind of like the, um, a sum of red, green, and blue, so meaning of green, in such a way that um, it kind of perceived like the more, the bigger Y is and the brighter the light seems to be. Um, so anyway, so the, this X, Y, Z is kind of just a mathematical construct uh, on top of RGB and it's used as a reference, okay? Uh, so I'll try to have that. Um, it's just used now as a reference. So all the color spaces that uh, are now derived from this um, uh, X and Y, uh, Z core space. Um, so everything starts from RGB. So we've done all the precipitous studies on RGB. Then we derived 
X, Y, Z are the linear combination of this RGB. And now we just use those and we can uh, have this nice representation. So in the graph here, you have the different values <coughs> of, uh, so we kind of factor, sorry, maybe Z was the intensity, I forgot. Anyway, we factored out the, um, the one of the dimensions that kept, just kept two, it's just a slice, okay, that corresponds to all the chroma you can see. And you have this uh, kind of horseshoe uh, representation uh, where you have the wavelengths here uh, corresponding to a particular point in your uh, color representation, all right? This is the line of the purples, and, and basically this is not a real line. In fact, this is not, um, these colors cannot be achieved by just a pure wavelength, okay? So if you're looking for a pure uh, hue, something that can be obtained by uh, just a one single wavelength, you have to be exactly on that uh, particular line, okay? So again, this X and Y coordinates is just um, mathematical transformation from your RGB <coughs> original space. And then what you've done here is like for every single input in that space, so X and Y, we can plot the corresponding RGB color that you see and that you plot that and this is what you get. So this is called the spectral locus, this uh, horseshoe uh, shape here. And uh, then it comes to the, what you can do with your color space, okay? And you'll see lots of these graphs if you look at uh, HDR TVs. You now they talked about different color spaces and you can see more colors and so on. Um, this is what's going on. So you have this XY representation and basically a lot of the colors um, here, actually you can't see them or you can't represent them in, the, in, in print, okay? Uh, what you can do is see the color really in that triangle. So that triangle corresponds to the triangle um, to the cube if you're uh, well, made by your, uh, by your colors. So I explain that briefly, okay? So you're in your RGB <coughs> space, the colors go say from zero to 255, okay? So you, know, you can have well, zero to one. Let's, let's say zero to one floating point, okay? So maximum red is one, minimum red is zero. And you can do that for blue, green, and, and, and red. And remember because we, you know, we have these negative colors. We know like we, some, some of the colors to get them, you need to have negative red or negative blue. We know that if you keep all the values between zero and one, you don't get all the colors, okay? And what you get, if you look at all the possible colors expressed by having values between zero and one, then you get this triangle of color, okay? And this triangle of color tells you the range of the possible colors that your display or whatever printing device can express, okay? And this is called the gamut. So when you look um, by a TV, um, if the, the gamut is uh, RGB space, uh, with CAE, whatever, year uh, space, it says that I can only display, I can only show you this particular range of colors. Does that make sense? Okay, so all that comes to the fact you have these negative values and therefore, uh, you can't just express all the colors, okay? Limited. There are different definitions of color spaces, okay? So the one we looked at is not the unique one. There's loads of definitions of RGB spaces, and they all have slight different gamuts, okay? And different shapes and so on. And so the, the more extended, the bigger the triangle is, the, the more colors you can actually express, okay? Yes? The, this one here. Yeah, well, remember all these things are kind of mathematical constructions, so you can have negative, super negative numbers and stuff like that, so. Um, <coughs> but yeah, I'm not so sure what you're supposed to see there. <laughs> uh, maybe it's just a definition of the cross space, and maybe actually you cannot, I don't know. It's a good point, I'll, uh, I, I, I'll look into it. But it's a mess, it's a mess, okay? So there's lots of different definitions of cross spaces and so on. So one point is um, the Y component, okay? So usually we refer to Y as being the intensity. And the intensity is simply, you know, how bright we perceive things, regardless of the color it is in, okay? And it's kind of like if you have to transform a picture into in black and white, you know, what you usually would do, you'd convert that to uh, the luminance only. 
and the luminance is usually expressed with that expression, so 0 0.3 uh, red plus 0 0.6 green plus 0 0.1 blue. There are many definitions of that, okay, because it's obviously not uh, hard science usually. Actually, the, the amount of green you put is higher, closer to 0 0.7, and the amount of blue, blue is almost insignificant in terms of intensity, okay? So we perceive blue is very useful for us in terms of, we're very sensitive to the, the shade of blue, but we're not sensitive to the intensity of the blue, okay? So if you put a lot of blue, we don't, because we have so many few cones of blue, it doesn't really affect us in terms of how bright it is. If you want something very bright, use green, okay? So if you have a picture, you want to have a quick view of what the intensity of the picture is, you can just take the green channel, only you know, discard the red and discard the blue, and just look at the green uh, channel, and that will give you a, a, a good start of what the intensity is. And that makes sense because, um, you know, plants, you know, vegetation, they absorb uh, a lot of um, um, uh, red and blue, and therefore they bounce you back a lot of uh, green. So you're very sensitive to green, okay? That kind of makes sense, right? So comes uh, broadcasting and uh, in broadcasting, they're looking for something a bit more useful than the RGB space. And one of the problems of RGB space, and you'll see that in the lab, that it's highly correlated. So you don't have, what you would like to have is a color space where you know, one dimension is just to say how uh, bright it is, and, and the other one tells you uh, what color it is, okay? So you kind of want to separate the notions of color and brightness. Uh, so YUV is a kind of nice way of Putting that is just a linear transformation of your RGB uh, with a special metrics, which might vary depending on the definition of what color space you're using again. Um, but basically, it allows you to find uh, coordinates. So you keep the Y, so the Y intensity, and then you have these U and V coordinates that express the kind of the chroma uh, of, your, of your particular pixel. And so this is kind of range, you know, I plotted for different values of U and V, the, the, the actual color you get, right? <coughs> and so it's kind of interesting to see these four main uh, parts, um, going from green, orange, um, uh, purple, and, and blue. And, uh, you know, you can find your color, particular color anywhere in that space. It's kind of a bit more perceptually interesting than RGB. Um, so a few notable uh, examples. So if you look at black, so black is uh, 0, 0, 0, and YUV is the same. Um, white is 255, 255, 255 in RGB, but it's just 255, 0, 0 in YUV. So Y is just intensity, really. Uh, gray, uh, in the RGB, gray is like if the three colors are the same. <coughs> okay, the three stimuli respond the same way. And uh, that gives you gray. In YUV, uh, you just set the chroma to zero, zero, and just the luminance to whatever that value is. Um, and of course, you know, pure red and pure green, then a bit more uh, complex to get. So let's say there's different variations on YUV, okay? Um, because remember many, like all that is, depends on the kind of perceptual studies you have and you know, what kind of, uh, I mean, they're not, it's not hard science, you know, it's like human science. Um, so you have different types of representation depending on which country you're in, uh, you live in. And so each broadcast system had different, uh, slightly different ways of thinking of the YUV color space. Um, so an example, so on top you have the, the picture in color, and I'll just show the three different planes of color you have. Um, so just showing the intensity of each of the the channel, so on the left, the Y component is really just the intensity. So that's the closest you will see, uh, think of, you know, if you say take a grayscale picture of that color picture. <coughs> and then the U and V are kind of funky colors, uh, but really they're kind of negative, going from negative to positive. And um, anyway, this is kind of more scary looking pictures. Um, now, there is a plethora of different color spaces, okay? Like, the, you can have, there's many books on different color spaces. One of the classic one is uh, HSV, where you're trying to really separate what the hue, the saturation, and the value are, and it's something you've probably seen in Photoshop and so on. Um, this is conversion you can find. And the, one of the issues with HSV is like it's a highly nonlinear transformation, okay? So you have 
So you, know, you look at the max, the mean, and do divisions and all sorts <coughs> of stuff. And the result for analysis, if you, if you have to work with pictures, usually we tend not to use that. So if you look at computer vision papers or image processing papers, we tend not to use HSV too much because it's just too nonlinear. And if a pixel, um, if one, you know, because of noise, like the, the values of the hue can switch dramatically or the saturation and so on, like it's, it's not quite nice what's going on. So it's nice to, uh, you know, it's used mostly in say, um, uh, if you're doing Illustrator or if you're like creating documents, um, then you might use that. But if you actually work with natural images, natural pictures, you tend not to use HSV too much. Um, all right, let me see how much. Ooh, <laughs> six percent. Ah, it's not looking good. Um, try to see how far we can go with that. So we've seen something about color, and now we'll talk something about um, spatial frequencies and d detail and the texture uh, where we can see. So there's so some definition first. So on the right here, you have uh, basically a sine wave going from dark to bright and dark to bright, and you call lines of your TV, for instance. And theta here is the angle uh, between you, that your eye makes with, say, uh, n, uh, n lines of your TV. Okay, so you have a TV, you have n lines, uh, you know, 10 lines on your TV you're looking at, and uh, you sit at uh, some distance, so you can work out the angle <coughs> theta between that your eyes mix with these uh, 10 lines, and so you can define a special frequency as being the number of uh, cycles or the lines you have divided by the angle um, that the field of view you have for these lines, okay? Uh, so that's the definition of your special frequency. Right, so here comes the Campbell Robson diagram, which is one of the most amazing stuff, uh, I think, perhaps in the world. Um, what you see here, so on the X is the spatial frequency. So you increase the spatial frequency, okay? And so, you know, it goes higher. And on the Y axis is the intensity of that uh, sine function. So, you know, bottom, it's very intense, and at the, at the top, it's. Um, at the top, it's, uh, it's getting fainter. And what your eye should see, it's something like that. Okay? You can also see uh, a, a delineation where your eyes just can't resolve anymore what's going on. Okay? So think of where you, know, you can see the details of what's going on and we can't see anymore. All right? So that kind of just an outline of you know, what most humans would see. Right? And that graph is basically you seeing uh, right in front of your eyes, uh, what your uh, contrast response is for you as a human being, okay? So you just look at this graph and you have right there for you, for yourself, the actual graph, I mean, if you, if you plot it, you actually have the graph for yourself of what your eyes see, okay? Uh, so this is, this is kind of the limit of your, uh, 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 of, of your system, of your human system, okay? And what is, what is striking here is like, okay, well, the first thing is, you know, we're not very good at high frequency, okay? So if it's, you know, go to the high frequencies, you're not, not going to resolve them very high. Well, funny enough, the low frequency as well, we're not very good, okay? Very, very low frequency, very uh, smooth surfaces. We're not very good at noting if it's very, very smooth or just very smooth, you know, like we don't know, okay? Uh, we're very good at kind of medium-sized frequencies, and then we can resolve them even if it's very faint. Okay. So this is the same graph in log space. Um, so the spatial frequency is expressed in log and the, the, the intensity in log as well. Um, but basically the same idea. Um, the eye for the luminance, we kind of have this sweet spot where we're very good at resolving up to very faint levels, uh, but we're not very good at the low frequency or the very high frequency. For the color, so we've done the same with just color graphs. Okay? Uh, uh, for different <coughs> variations of um, chrominance. And we found that uh, it's even worse, okay, so in terms of high frequency, we're just, we're just rubbish at color, okay? So just a human eye, we're, just, we don't, we're not good, okay? And that means, um, right, I'm going to skip that too, guys, okay? Just trying to focus on these images and hope that uh, it doesn't die before that. Um, and I'm going to switch out the light because otherwise you won't see anything.
Right, so that's the original picture um, actually taken by uh, Professor Anil Kokaram. That's from Trinidad and Tobago. So that's from where he's from. Um, so you have a crop here, the detail of the, the palm tree on the, on the right. Okay? What we're going to do here is uh, called chroma subsampling. So we're going to look at every single pixel and say we're only going to, uh, we're going to keep all the y. So per pixel, you have three, uh, three components, so y, u, v, and um, or RGB if you want. But in this case, we'll just work in y, u, v color space. And we're going to keep all the y components, but we're going to only keep every uh, second um, u and v components both in x and y direction. So basically, we kind of only keep every you know, one in four, effectively, um, chroma component. Another way of looking at it, you take your y, u, v picture, you keep the y on its side, okay? And you take the u and v and reduce the resolution by half, okay? You don't sample by half, you reduce the size of the picture by half and then blow it up again, okay? So you lose half of the, well, uh, three quarter of the information. All right, does it make sense? So, this is what happens, okay? So, this is the original picture, and this is uh, when you remove, uh, so three quarter of the color, or overall 50% 50, 50 of your information. So, if you do the maths, you keep all the Y components, but throw away three quarter of the remaining two, so that gives you 50% um, of reduction in amount of data you send. Uh, but the point is, you see no difference, okay? I mean, you just don't see it, okay? So you, we threw away half of the data, okay? But your eyes is like, I don't know, okay? And, but that's just because we work in the color, okay? If you do the same, so, okay, so that's actually even further. So we, we throw away here every fourth uh, pixel, so <coughs> throwing, sorry, uh, 16 to one ratio on the chrominance. Uh, so really, like, we really don't keep much information in color and still very hard to see any uh, noticeable difference. <coughs> <coughs> this is what happens if you do the same trick with Y, okay? So in this case, I keep the U and V, so the chrominance information intact, but I throw away, you know, a, a, a subsample, I, I lower the resolution of, of Y, and then, you know, flip back in between in both. Uh, so here, okay, I keep 68% of the information, like two thirds of the information is preserved, okay? I only threw away a third of the information. So I mainly totally damaged Y, okay, the luminance. And it's, it looks horrible, okay? You can see it's not, it's not good, okay? But here I've done, a, a threw away two thirds of the information, only kept a third, so it's uh, supposedly you know, worse. But I only worked, I've done all the damage in the chrominance information and I don't see a difference from the original, okay? So that's just to show you that uh, human visual uh, perception is very important in, in compression because you will see that, okay, you can do a lot of damage in the criminals and you know, that's okay. You know, you still see something nice. So you just have to preserve, to be, to be careful with what you do. Uh, so different schemes to do that. They're called, you know, the name 422, 411, 420. You look at the slides um, to see what it really means, uh, but basically they're just ways of telling how you do the subsampling on your skin. So four is always for the luminance, okay? So four means you, you keep all the, all the luminance. You never throw away the luminance, you always keep the luminance. Two, two, one, one, two is just ways of saying how you're going to subsample the uh, chrominance. The other aspect that's interesting is called masking, okay? And uh, basically, uh, so you have to picture the same picture here on the left, so it's noise free. We added some Gaussian noise, or well, I've added some Gaussian noise on the right, okay? Um, uh, you can say it's thermal noise or if it's like, you know, uh, poor light or it's an old camera or something like that. And it's quite visible, okay? You can see, you can see the noise. Now, I've done the same, okay? So uh, I've took two blocks of size 100 by 100, and I've added uh, one on the left and one on the right, okay? So can you see where I've put the noisy block on the left? 
like a volunteer to tell me what it is? Top corner. Top corner, right. On the right, can you tell me where I put that very noisy block? Nah, all right. Here, okay. And that makes sense, okay. So if you add noise to something which is low frequency, that should be super noticeable. And if you add noise to something which is already highly textured, then you probably won't even notice. Okay, so again, good idea to know where you can do things. You know, if you have something with a high frequency, you probably can do more crazy stuff there, like do more lossy uh, compression than if you work on a very smooth area. If you have a very smooth area, maybe you want to be careful not to add too many artifacts there because they'll be super noticeable. Um, and that probably uh, is going to conclude talk because no, that's fine, still have something, yeah. All right, uh, coming back here, um, that come back to something here, it's called the uh, Weber slow and something not only true for vision but for most human things. Basically when you have um, a physical um, input, okay, so say you, you're, you're, you're lifting a very heavy weight, okay, so 10 kilograms of um, something, whatever. How are you going to perceive if you add 10, uh, you know, uh, one kilogram to that, okay? Uh, well, it's going to be perceptible, but it's not necessarily going to be mass, you know, massive impact on you, okay? But if you have to start with 10 grams of water and you add, you know, one kilogram of water, you will perceive that very much, okay? So the, 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 the kind of, the law is like to say, what you perceive is the ratio of the, the difference between the stimuli and to the magnitude of the stimuli itself. So it's delta i divided by i. So i is the intensity of your stimulus, and what you perceive really is delta i over i. And you know, same story goes like for pictures, if you have a bright spot in the middle, which is i plus delta i, and you're surrounded by i, the, the way you perceive that, you perceive this delta i is related to what i is. Okay, so if you eye is very bright, if you have you know, very bright colors, uh, maybe you're not going to perceive the change in the brightness so much. Okay, you perceive that in the dark areas where we're stronger. Okay, going back to the texture, the same story. So you can say in the picture I showed you where you know your delta i is the noise. Okay, how much noise you add to what's the degradation you add um, to your system. If the system is noise free and very flat, and has no texture, then I is very low. And if you add a bit of delta I, you'll perceive that quite a lot. But if your I, uh, if, you, if your I is very high, so in our case, very textured, then if you add a bit of delta I, a bit of texture, 